welcome uh, everyone to the fourth uh, online platform economics seminar. Uh, it is, I'm so glad we moved to online. This actually is a completely new experience. Uh, it's different, uh, but in many, many ways it's better. We can have a, a wider audience and uh, it's, it's great to have so many good people in terms of speakers and attendees. Uh, very interesting new format. Uh, so uh, my name is Hannah Haloburda. I will be moderator today and we have Oslem Bedre de Foyle. The fall. Did I pronounce it correctly? Is that's left? fine. Definitely. That's the French Foley. part of the surname. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's really difficult to guess which one is which language uh, family. Uh, so uh, Auslem uh, is going to present a paper joint with uh, uh, Gary Biglazer uh, on platform competition for exclusivity with uh, Marquis Seller. And the way we are, the, the, the way this new format works is we are going to have 40 minutes of Oslin presenting the paper. Uh, it is going to be broken up uh, every now and then. Oslin is going to stop and, uh, and take questions. Uh, if you have questions, uh, mostly clarifying questions at this point, uh, please type them in, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the chat. Uh, either to myself or to everyone, if you want. When Oslan will stop, then I will ask the questions. At the end, we are going to have another 20 minutes for general Q&A, and at that point, uh, you, there will be more free uh, flowing questions, not just clarifying questions. Uh, we will stop recording after an hour, but uh, we will hang out, and uh, you're welcome to ask more questions and have more discussion after that, that one hour. So this is the, this is the format. Uh, the seminar, once again, is recorded. If you do not want to be recorded, then, uh, then act appropriately. <laughs> uh, don't ask question. Uh, but, or if you want to ask question anonymously, I can do it for you. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, Oslem, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah, for being the moderator of this talk. And thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my joint work with Gary Beckleser, who is also uh, here with us today attending the webinar. So let me start by sharing my screen. Hopefully that works as expected. So go to the full screen mode. Is it fine? Yeah? Yes. Good. Excellent. So this paper is about platform competition for exclusivity with a marquee product seller. As I said, this is joint work with Gary, and uh, I would like to first start by giving some motivation for this work. We observe platforms imposing restrictions on multi-homing or switching behavior of their customers. In particular, many industries, platform signs exclusive deal with some premium content provider or a product seller. For instance, in pay TV markets, we see pay TV providers signing exclusive contracts with some popular content providers like shows, series, and sports events. And in the app stores market like Apple and Google Android signing some exclusivity clauses with some popular apps for, uh, with the app developers and music streaming platform signing exclusivity contracts with uh, famous artists. And game platforms have been using this type of exclusivity clauses with popular games. And recently, ebook platforms have also started accusing exclusivity with some popular authors or podcasters. And indeed, this type of exclusivity was already existing in traditional two sided markets like, like shopping malls, signing exclusivity clauses within the radius, basically restricting those anchor stores not being available at a competing shopping center. And we also see some non-exclusive content product being available on those competing uh, platforms. So the, what is the main motivation for this work? There have been significant antitrust concerns arising from the exclusive dealing provisions, and in particular, they might dampen competition in the market and also for the market. And they have been dealt under the abuse of dominant position clauses. Basically, they were only considered as anti-competitive if they are used by a dominant player or a platform. And though what were those concerns? They might lead to tipping in the market. This is particularly a concern for markets with network effects, where we expect tipping or monopolization of the market uh, being more likely. And that might be indeed uh, triggered by exclusivity cl closes. 
or they in any market they can reduce variety they can weaken competition in the market and also they might foreclose a potential rival uh, in particular if it's more efficient or valuable that would be detrimental for the welfare and there have been several cases both in the us in europe basically banning exclusivity clauses used by dominant players for instance microsoft cases in both europe and us and also mastercard and visa were banned from using exclusivity clauses with their merchants, basically preventing them from accepting Amex cards. But very recently, European Commission fined Google for the usage of exclusivity clauses with the Google Android uh, phone manufacturers, basically Google imposing them to use the Google search as the exclusive search uh, engine on those phones. And of course, exclusivity means competition for exclusivity, and that might also increase the prices for those very valuable content, which is the case, for instance, Champions League games. And that also has raised some significant public attention, basically those products, contents being only available on very expensive channels. So then what we do in this paper is try to understand profitability and implications of exclusive dealing provisions in those markets where we have network effects. And we would like to make this distinction between the exclusivity with a marquee product or a popular product between the product seller and the platforms. And what are the key elements of the model? We have initial asymmetry between the platforms. So one platform has a larger locked in base than the other one. And we also want to capture this cross group network effects between buyers and sellers, as well as we would like to allow for within group negative or congestion effects arising from competition between different qualities of products. And in our model, platforms will be choosing the quality endogenously via two channels by determining number of unpopular, what we call the fringe products, at the same time deciding whether to have the marquee product and if so, exclusively. So these will be the, the two ways of achieving the quality for the platform. So the quality will be endogenous in our model. And the key questions that we would like to answer in this paper are, when do we expect to see exclusive dealing in equilibrium? If so, who wins the exclusive dealing with the market product seller? What are the welfare implications? And then we also raise the question of if we allow platforms to price discriminate, basically set different prices to their locked in consumers and the new consumer segment, how do we, the, how, uh, what would the implications for the profitability and the welfare implications of exclusive dealing? So these are our research questions. Very briefly, what do we find as main results? So the big platform, we find that wins the exclusive dealing with the marquee product seller in the unique equilibrium if the marquee product matters for the quality of the small platform. Okay, and I will be more precise about what we mean by this. And we also find that there exists non-exclusive equilibrium otherwise. In other words, if the marquee product does not change the quality level of the small platform. And exclusive dealing, whenever it arises in equilibrium, lowers welfare by reducing variety, basically number of fringe products on the small platform, and also the average quality of the small platform. And price discrimination makes exclusive dealing more likely to arise in equilibrium when the initial asymmetry between small and the big platforms in their locked-in bases is large. However, it increases the total welfare when this initial asymmetry is small, when the platforms are similar. So we have different, basically, unclear welfare implications for the price discrimination. We are not the first analyzing exclusive dealing. Uh, there is a very well-developed literature and the vertical contracting. Basically, most of the literature tried to answer the key question that the Chicago school, e school economists were raising. How could an inefficient or less valuable incumbent to compensate a buyer not to buy from the more valuable entrant or a rival. Okay, so that was the Chicago school question. And they gave different lines of answers, basically saying under which conditions we might see exclusive dealing occurring in equilibrium in an inefficient way. What we are doing in this paper, of course, we want to look at the exclusive dealing profitability, but we try to shut down those channels that the previous literature were emphasizing as the exclusive dealing mechanisms that could arise in equilibrium. So we try to shut down those channels because we would like to mainly focus on those markets where we have network effects. So we try to understand how the network effects matters for the profitability and the implications of uh, exclusive dealing. 
So to be a little bit more precise, so there is also literature analyzing exclusivity contracts in, with network effects. Our key differences from this literature is gonna be, we will look at initially asymmetric platforms. So one is big in the locked in base than the other one. And also we will introduce heterogeneous content, in other words, heterogeneous qualities of those products. And we will have both cross group network effects as well as within group congestion or competition effects between the products. So this will be the key differences from this existing literature. And I, lastly, just let me emphasize that the key finding of this literature was that when there are strong network effects, they mainly consider the cross group network effects. When the network effects are strong or the platforms are close competitors, then the exclusive dealing is more likely to be profitable in equilibrium. But these are the cases also the exclusive dealing is less likely to hurt welfare. So this literature talking about network effects basically give us this common finding saying that, look, when there are network effects, it's less likely to harm exclusive dealing. If it's profitable, it's less likely to harm the total welfare. And we will add to this literature by looking at also this congestion effects on top of the cross group network externalities. So let me pause here and see if there are any clarification questions. So I guess <clears throat> a clarification, not so much clarification, but Ji Choi is asking whether um, uh, exclusive dealing can be used by entrant to break into the market and how does it fit with your results? So indeed, that's a very good question. So we have like, for instance, uh, Bruno's very early paper made this point of the wide and concurrent type of strategies might help an entrant to come to the market by breaking this chicken and egg problem to be viable. But that, you know, there are not so many papers finding entrant winning the exclusivity in, in equilibrium, but there is a paper by Robin Nee showing that indeed in the video game console market, right, uh, entrant might benefit from exclusive dealing with the popular games. We have predictions that that can happen in equilibrium under some circumstances of our model. So indeed, we, we will obtain this in equilibrium uh, under some conditions. So we allow the, for this to be uh, happening also. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Then let me continue uh, to uh, describe the model that we are looking at. We are modeling two platforms, platform B and platform S, which Platform B has a locked-in base measure of beta B. Platform S has a locked-in base measure of beta S. And platforms are competing for a mass of new consumers on the hoteling line. So basically they have this locked-in bases backyards, but they are competing for the new segment. New consumers are single homing. In other words, they choose either platform B or S to visit. And then platforms, uh, we assume that they are effectively competing, so the market is covered, so the transportation parameters is slow enough, even without the marquee seller. And we also uh, would like to analyze different qualities of products that the platforms could have. So that's why we have this fringe product, which is our on average low quality product. Each platform can get access to, there is no competition for fringe products, and each product costs F. And there is some product called marquee product, which is our high quality product for which platforms are competing effectively, in particular if the marquee product seller signs an exclusive deal that I'm going to be a little bit more precise about what it is. Okay, a marquee product has a fixed cost FM. So this is the broad structure of our uh, model. Let me be a little bit more precise about our assumptions. So we assume that the platform B is our big platform which has a larger locked-in base than platform S. So beta B is larger than beta S. Platform S might have a locked-in base of zero. So that would correspond to an entrant platform, but we don't have any fixed cost of entry in order to, again, shut down this channel of economies of scale from the entry that previous literature emphasizes the potential for having exclusivity in equilibrium. Okay, so we give the highest chances for the platform S to be viable in this market. So there are no fixed costs of um, entering for a platform which even doesn't have a locked in base. Okay. And then we assume this marquee product seller has this quality, the M, which is certain, but fringe products have uncertain values for consumers. So we assume that the fringe product could have a value L with probability P and value H with probability one minus P H is greater than L. Binomial distribution is not 
crucial for us. I will try to comment on it at the end. But we assume that the marquee seller has this quality which is above the average fringe firm. So this is the average quality of a fringe product. So marquee seller is on average better than the fringe. Here we could also have some uncertain value for the marquee. Again, this is not crucial for our model. We try to capture the main effects that we are interested in in the simplest way. So that's why we have this specification here. Okay. So just after the assumptions, so these red were our assumptions, let me be precise about the timing of the interactions. So stage one, try to read the slide from the bottom towards the up. So in stage one, the firms, platforms choose their contracts. Basically, they sign a contract, they co specify a lump sum transfer to market seller conditional on the market structure. So lump sum transfer TBE of the platform B basically offered if market seller is exclusively available on platform B and lump sum transfer of TBNE is offered if market seller is non-exclusive, meaning that available on both platforms. And the same for platform S and platforms offer those contracts simultaneously. I didn't say it previously, but there's also important assumption in our model. We assume that the platforms have rich enough contracts with the fringe product sellers, as well as the marquee seller, that enables each platform to control the number of fringe products in equilibrium, which is MB here, that uh, notation. In equilibrium, why are using this contracts with the fringe product sellers? And at the same time, we assume that platforms can control the products prices in equilibrium. Why do we assume that? Because we want to get rid of any contractual inefficiency arising because of any contractual you know, uh, distortions here. We really want to focus on that if there are no uh, distortions in the contracts between the platform and the sellers, even in that situation, do we expect to see exclusive dealing arising? Because and I, again, previous literature emphasized contractual inefficiency in the, in the vertical chains could lead to exclusive dealing in equilibrium and we want to shut down those channels. Okay, so this is on purpose that we assume those contracts are perfect, but this is really to focus on the key mechanism here that we would like to analyze. And in those contracts, firms, the platforms also choose their number of fringe products. So since we assume that the platforms can control them perfectly, and BE is the number of fringe of platform B if the market structure is exclusive with the marquee seller, and MB and E is the number of fringe products that the platform B has if platform marquee seller is available on both platforms. And the same for the platform S. So we have these two, you know, the menus of uh, contracts that the platform set in the initial stage. And in the second stage, the marquee seller decides which contracts to accept and acceptance decisions are observable. However, the terms of the contracts are not observed by the rival. For instance, if exclusivity of the platform B is accepted by um, marquee seller, then platform S does not observe the number of fringe products set by the platform B, okay? So in a sense, they are setting their uh, uh, number of fringe products as if they, it was set simultaneously because they don't observe it. And they, that, that's why we are looking for Bayesian Nash equilibrium of this game. And in stage three, platforms set their subscription fees as J for platform J and the product prices. Again, we assume that the platforms can control those fringe product and the market product price if they have the market product in equilibrium. And this SJ is a subscription fee to the buyers. And they set the same SJ to their locked in base or to the new consumers. But in the case when we allow price discrimination, we allow platforms to set different subscription fee to their loyal base versus new consumers. That's what we name as price discrimination in this model. And in stage four, consumers observe which platforms have, which platform has the marquee, if both or one. And they also observe the subscription fees set by each platform and the product prices. And then they, those new consumers choose one of the B or S and the locked in base consumers decide whether to visit their preferred platform or not, okay? And the final stage, once they are, consumers are in the platform, they draw NJ draws of products from the pool of the fringe products on the platform. And each draw has probability P low value and probability H 
high value. So these draws are IID. So this is an important assumption for our model. And consumers then, after getting those draws, decide whether to buy the fringe product or the marquee product if the marquee is available, and they decide whether to buy the fringe or not if there is no marquee available. Okay. So there is a multiple stages. So we look for a bias in Nash equilibrium again of this model again. And I would like to pause here to see if there are any questions on the model and the assumptions. Uh, yes, Aslan. So uh, Jacques Cremer is asking whether this is a hoteling line. Uh, I guess you, 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 you discussed a little bit more about the, um, about the model, but I think it would be useful to explain uh, what is the role of the hoteling line. And I guess it only applies to one side of the market, right? Yes. So basically our uh, consumers in the new consumer segment are like hoteling line, but what is crucial for us is not just the uniform distribution of these new consumers. So this is not crucial, but what is crucial is horizontal differentiation between platforms. Okay. So this is important assumption, but the uniform distribution of those consumers is not an important assumption in the model. And the consumers in the backyard, they are, they, they have homogeneous types. So there is no elastic demand in this sense. They either buy from their preferred platform, all of them or not. But again, this is not crucial for the model. We could have had also heterogeneous types on the backyards as well. Okay, so this is uh, just to simplify the model. And there is no horizontal differentiation for, uh, for the products. There is kind of a horizontal differentiation. So what we have in the model is that fringe products have uncertain types for consumers, right? So it could be a high type or a low type, but consumers you know, they draw those types in the platform. Before coming to platform, they don't know it. So they only know the number of fringe. So they have an expected value of those draws before coming to the platform. And in the model, in the benchmark case, we don't have uncertainty on the marquee product type, but we could also have had this in the model. Again, that wouldn't change qualitative results, but that would make just our lives a little bit more complicated in the solution. So uh, a couple of people ask whether uh, or how many products a consumer can buy, whether it's one or more. Very good question. It's an important assumption. This is unique demand. So they draw those products on the platform, okay? And they look at the value and they decide whether to buy the fringe product or the marquee. So one or other, basically, this is the unique demand assumption. And I will comment at the end in the discussion how this is important for us. And uh, if there is no marquee, they just decide whether to buy the print product or not. So this is a unique demand model. Yeah. And this is important. Okay. Uh, one, uh, one more, the, uh, how sensitive is the model uh, to the assumption that the platform cannot change the number of fringe products after the marquee seller has rejected, rejected its offer? It's by Roberto Sirkisian. It can change, sorry, uh, maybe it was not clear from my presentation. So if, for instance, platform a, a B has an exclusive contract accepted by the marquee seller, in this stage, stage two, platform S observes that, observes that it lost the exclusivity and it lost marquee seller, then platform S could choose its own number of fringe products at that point, okay? So they don't allow, basically we want to have them the optimal numbers of fringe products in any configuration of the market structure. Okay, so, uh, so the contracts are not just set at stage one and take it or leave it, they can be adjusted. So basically if M accepts exclusive contract of B say, then B does not have an incentive to adjust MBE. Okay, so it is renegotiation proof in the sense. However, if M accepts the contract of B, then S might be interested in changing its number of fringe products and that we allow it to be the case in, in the model. Okay, so this would be in stage two. Exactly, exactly. So uh, one more from Bruno Julien, uh, who observes uh, NB and NS uh, and when in the timing? So NB and NS, can only be observed right before consumers uh, 
So the MB and SO, it's not observed when the platforms are choosing. So uh, again, it's not observed before stage two, okay? But the after stage two, it's gonna be observed. Very cool. Okay. Right. By, by all parties, basically, when the platforms are choosing their subscription prices and the product prices. Okay. Uh, so I have one more question. Uh, so as I understand the uh, quality, the expected quality of, of French products are the same, is exactly the same on both platforms. So uh, I know you will be talking about comparing the qualities uh, of the platform. So the quality of the platform uh, is, is what? Is it just whether the market? I'm going to define it now. I'm okay. going to define it explicitly. I think okay. it's a very important question. Yeah. Okay. So I guess we are ready to move on. Thanks. Okay. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you. Again, please ask questions if uh, continuation doesn't answer your question. Okay. So in the equilibrium, the first point that we are finding is that the platform set their product prices at their marginal cost, which is assumed to be zero in the model, because they could capture expected surplus of consumers from the consumption via subscription fees. It's similar to Armstrong and Vickers model. So that's why we, our model predicts positive subscription fees and zero uh, variable fees. For instance, if you want to think about the real world, implication that would be like Netflix charging subscription fees positive but not charging per view views of its content. Okay. The expected quality to answer your question, Hannah, is uh, VJ in the notation. If the platform does not have the marquee, that's going to be P to the power NJ times L because this is the probability that the consumer will accept, uh, expect to draw low quality marquee, uh, fringe product on the platform. And with the probability one minus P to the power NJ, consumer expects to draw high quality fringe product on the market, on the, on the platform, okay? Again, this uh, P to the power NJ is because of the IID assumption. So each draw is independent. So that's why I expect the low draw of all these draws with this probability, okay? And this is the expected quality of the platform if platform does not have the marquee, but has number NJ of fringe products. And if the platform has the marquee, then whenever the draw of the fringe product is low, consumer expects to consume the high quality marquee VM because VM is higher than L. And whenever the draw of the fringe product is high, consumer again except expects to consume the high quality fringe product. Okay, so then the, this is the expected quality of platform J. If platform J has marquee product, that's why the notation BJM. Okay, and a couple of observations adding more fringe products increases the expected quality without marquee or with the marquee. So, in other words, the partial derivative of this VJ and VJM are positive with respect to NJ. Okay. But there are decreasing returns from the fringe products. In other words, adding more and more fringe products gives you less quality improvements if you have already have a lot of number of fringe products. Okay, so there are decreasing returns from adding fringe and more valuable marquee. So when the value of the marquee product goes up, that also increases the expected quality of this platform, which has the marquee product. Okay, as you can see, that's the lower straw basically. And more interestingly, when the marquee product becomes more valuable, returns from adding fringe products goes down. In other words, uh, if you want to increase your quality by adding fringe products, that pays off less if you have higher quality marquee. Why? Because what marquee does is basically cutting the left tail of the distribution. And instead of consuming the low quality fringe, you consume high quality marquee product if the draw happens to be the low quality fringe draw. Okay, so adding marquee, basically adding the fringe products are less valuable if your marquee product is more valuable. Okay, so they, that gives us this uh, interaction between two products and that's how we generate the congestion effects indeed for the quality provision of the platform. 
And what we do is basically we consider this model instead of saying platforms are choosing their number of fringe products and deciding whether to have the marquee or not. At the end, this is a hoteling competition, as Jack pointed out in the in the benchmark model. So platforms are just choosing their quality levels in this competition. OK, and then they decide how to achieve this quality at the minimum cost. So basically, which number of fringe firms and whether to have the marquee or not will affect their cost given the optimal quality they would like to achieve. Okay, so that's why we want to invert these quality functions and think about what is the number of fringe a platform J needs in order to achieve quality VJ without the marquee, and what is the number of fringe that the platform needs to achieve the quality level VJ with the marquee. So that's how we write down these equations. Why do we do that? Because we are going to write the, the cost function of the platform for quality level VJ when it doesn't have the marquee. This is going to be just the fixed cost of the fringe firms times this function that I drove in the previous uh, slide, not explicitly, but just uh, define it, and JVJ. So basically, that will be the cost of achieving quality level VJ when platform does not have the marquee. Okay. And then we write down the profit of the platform J at the equilibrium subscription fees. This is a standard hoteling competition with different qualities, but the difference is that the firms have different backyards or the locked in bases. Okay, so basically, this is the profit expression of the firm J, platform J, when it has quality VJ, rival has quality V minus J, and the firm J base locked in base is beta J, and the rival locked in base is beta minus J. And we are evaluating these variable profits at the optimal subscription fees they chose in equilibrium. So I'm not showing this part of the solution because it's pretty standard. What is important is that this cost of achieving quality level VJ will determine the optimal quality of each platform. Because platform is going to maximize this profit with respect to VJ to determine its optimal quality. Okay? And then we solve this question of optimal quality question when the platforms don't have the marquee product. And then we show that in the first lemma, the big platform chooses higher quality level than the small platform without the marquee. And the number of fringe products on the big platform is higher than on the small platform, again, when there is no marquee in the market. Okay, so without the marquee, so this is the benchmark to compare us with the marquee case. Why is it the case? Because the big platform, because it has a larger locked in customer base, it can amortize fixed costs of the fringe over a larger base. So it can have a larger profit from quality improvements starting from equal, equal quality levels. Okay, so that's why big platform having larger subscription base is going to offer higher quality before the marquee product seller is available. Okay, so then the next question, what's going to happen if we have a marquee on the platform? Cost function will be different because now I will need a different number of fringe firms to achieve the same quality level. That's why I denote it NJM, because now I have the marquee, which basically cuts the left tail of the fringe distribution, so that I need a different number of fringe firms to achieve a given quality level than before. And of course, I might have some other fixed costs. This is exogenous cost of the marquee seller product, and this is the endogenous part of the cost, which is depending on how much lump sum transfer I'm paying to the marquee seller in equilibrium. But that would not matter for my optimal quality choice because the variable part is the crucial part that will determine that. And to, to, to be a little bit more uh, careful here, when I have the marquee, the platform, when I say I, the platform has the marquee, its minimum quality level will be VM. When the platform does not have the marquee, its minimum quality level will be L. Okay, because if it sets a zero number of fringe for, sorry, the, the, if it has only one fringe firm, and if the draw happens to be low, for instance, that's going to be the minimum quality for a platform. But if platform has the, the marquee product, even the low quality fringe arises, consumer will choose by the marquee product. So this will be the lowest quality of the platform. Okay. So after that, what we show is that if the platform has the marquee product, then the marquee and the fringe products are substitutes for the platform. 
So the, when the value of the marquee goes up, platform chooses less number of fringe firms. So we, what, this, why this is interesting? Because we know that there are this cross-group network effects. So marquee product attracts more buyers to the, to the platform. So this is the traffic effect due to the cross-group network effects. Normally, this should increase the demand for the fringe products as well. But because of the fact that fringe products and the marquee products are competing against each other, and here, this unit demand assumption gives us the highest substitution between those products, basically, then based, what we are showing is that this congestion effect dominates and the products are substitutes from the viewpoint of the platform. And the intuition is very simple. I have already shown that the, when I have a high, more valuable marquee product, adding one more fringe is less valuable for, for improvement of the quality of the platform, okay? So that's why having the higher value for the marquee product lowers the number of fringe products that the platform chooses in equilibrium, okay? And the lemma three shows when and uh, how does the marquee product affect optimal quality of the platforms the first bullet point is basically state in condition when it doesn't affect. So if without the marquee, small platform were, was already choosing a quality above VM, then, without, then having the marquee on one platform or both wouldn't affect the equilibrium quality of uh, the platforms, okay? And if the platform J's quality before the marquee was below VM, then having the marquee product will increase the quality of that platform. So just to give very brief uh, intuition for this result, if small platform had a quality level above the VM, then it must be the case also the big platform has a quality level above VM without the marquee product. But we, what we do, did in the paper is that we showed that the marginal cost of quality is the same with or without the marquee. And we believe that this is driven from the IID assumption of this binomial distribution, but not the distribution of uh, the type of the distribution. And because of the fact that marginal cost is the same for the quality, if the quality levels were already above VM, having the marquee does not affect their optimal qualities. And more importantly, we show that the cost of quality is indeed a convex function. What it means is that the production function for quality is concave. So there are this decreasing returns from adding more uh, the fringe products uh, in the market to achieve a given quality level. Okay, so let me pause here and see if there are any questions. So, uh, Jacques Kremer says, I do not understand the role of the explicit modeling of the quality in the absence of the marquee product. Why speak about the free products rather than just a vertical quality component? So uh, in the absence, that's a, that's a relevant point. So in the absence of the basically marquee product, it doesn't matter so much, okay? So, um, but what we want to capture is that when I see more uh, number of fringe products available on the platform, my expected value of getting a better match is higher, okay? So this is what we are capturing with this fringe product distribution and again, binomial is not crucial. Any IID distribution will give us this type of uh, expectations. Now, this is important. And again, when I see the marquee at the same platform, then we need this cross derivative of the, you know, the quality increase from the fringe is getting more import, less important when the marquee is available. So we have this cross effects between the marquee and the fringe. So that's why uh, we need it. But of course, I mean, um, He's right pointing out that if we did not have the marquee, we don't need to model it in this way. But we want to capture this competition between the marquee and the fringe product. So that's why we have uh, this type of modeling, yeah. Thank you. There are no other questions at this point. Okay. Um, and uh, Aslam, we yeah. are at the 40 minute mark. Uh, so if you still have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of slides to show us, uh, maybe we can postpone all the other questions until the Q and A afterwards. Okay. Maybe, uh, that's a good idea, but we started like five minutes, uh, yes. So, 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 okay. so, so I have so five the, minutes, another five minutes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Excellent. I, think Excellent. That maybe we'll hold I hope I will be done uh, by that. Okay. Excellent. Then, 
uh, proposition one basically shows that there exists a non-exclusive equilibrium if the marquee does not matter for the quality of the small platform. And this is the case if the small was already choosing a quality level above the marquee product value before the, having the marquee, without having the marquee. And what we show is that there exists no non-exclusive equilibrium otherwise. Okay? Why is it the case? If the small bus platform was already choosing a quality above the VM, then we cannot affect the rival quality by excluding the rival from the marquee. Again, this is because of the fact that in that case, having the marquee will not change the quality level of the S. It will only change its total cost of achieving this quality, but not the quality level. Okay? And in that case, we have a non-exclusive equilibrium. However, if S was choosing a quality level below VM before the mar having the marquee, then having the marquee will increase, would increase the quality of the S. And then in that case, excluding S from the marquee gives competitive advantage to the B. Okay? So how does it work? Basically, consider a candidate non-exclusive equilibrium. It must be the case that the marquee is indifferent between the sum of the non-exclusive tariffs and the, one of the e uh, exclusive tariff of the each platform. For starting from this equilibrium, B has a profitable deviation by offering slightly more for exclusivity to the marquee because that will enable B to make a discrete jump in its profit by gaining this competitive advantage against the rival. Okay? So this is how we kill non-exclusive equilibrium if marquee matters for the quality of the small platform. And we show that there exists an exclusive equilibrium where the big platform wins the marquee and there exists no exclusive equilibrium where S wins the marquee in the benchmark model. What is the intuition? Remember, without the marquee, S, B would like to achieve a higher quality level. In order to do that, B was having more number of higher number of fringe products. But then if B gets the marquee, it can save more fixed costs from those high number of fringe products than S. So that's why starting from the same number of fringe products, B can generate more profit than S having the market exclusively because it has a larger base, okay? And so indeed in equilibrium, B can do even better. So that's why B can always overbid S in the exclusive dealing competition, okay? And allowing very quickly, allowing price discrimination. At the beginning, I promised that if we allow platforms to offer different prices to loyals and the locked in base customers, what we find is that price discrimination will make the competitive segment more competitive, so it will lower returns from improving quality in that segment. At the same time, price discrimination will increase prices for the locked in base customers, and that will increase the quality improvement returns from the locked in base. But B will benefit more from that than S, so what we find is that price discrimination will induce B to choose a higher quality. However, it might induce S to choose a lower quality if initial asymmetry is significantly large. Just to consider, for instance, beta S to be zero, for instance, in that case, what price discrimination does is basically lowers the old returns from quality improvements for S so that the S will choose a lower quality. Okay, you can find then the critical thresholds for beta S sufficiently low below which this is gonna be happen. But then what it means for our model is that it makes exclusive dealing equilibrium more likely to be the unique equilibrium. Why? Because it lowers the S quality, so then this VM will be more binding for this threshold of uniqueness. And in the exclusive dealing equilibrium, S will choose lower quality and B will choose higher quality when we allow price discrimination. And when platform initial asymmetries are very close to each other, price discrimination will increase the quality of both platforms, so it shrinks the region where exclusive dealing is unique equilibrium, okay? So um, I think I'm running out of time. This is my last slide for welfare implications and then I will con conclude. So what are the critical welfare implications of this model? Third space in our paper is the having the marquee product on both platforms and exclusive dealing is the unique equilibrium where marquee product matters for S quality and exclusive dealing harms welfare by lowering quality and the variety on the small platform. And B prefers exclusive dealing in our model to capture more rent from the marquee seller. So when the initial asymmetry between platforms is large enough, price discrimination might lower welfare by lowering quality provision by the small platform. 
However, when this initial asymmetry is not big, then price discrimination increases the wealth there. Okay? So uh, just let me then move on. I don't have time, so just go back and uh, conclude, because we also look at this case where the number of fringe firms is fixed, so not endogenous, and uh, it, I will give you those results just in this conclusion slide. So this paper aims to understand platform competition profitability for competition for exclusivity with a market product seller and uh, the platforms initially asymmetric in their locked-in basis. We capture both cross-group network effects and between group congestion or negative competition effects between these different qualities and allow platforms to choose quality endogenously by choosing their number of low quality products and deciding whether to have the market product or exclusively or not. And in the unique equilibrium, the big platform wins exclusive dealing with the marquee if marquee matters for the quality of the small platform. And exclusive dealing always lowers welfare in our model. And this is also true when the fringe number is fixed, not endogenous in the model. Okay? And price discrimination might harm welfare when initially asymmetry is large. Price discrimination indeed might help us to win exclusivity. This is the part I wanted to come at the end, if I hope there is a question on that, when the fringe number is fixed, not endogenous in the model. Why fringe number fixed is important because indeed in some contexts, maybe platforms cannot condition fringe condition on the market structure. So then we also look at this case and the analysis. Okay. Let me stop here. I have some discussion slides, but hopefully there will be some questions that I can use these points to answer those questions. Okay, thank you, Oslim. So uh, I, I think that uh, now it, uh, it's time for Q and A, and yeah. uh, the way, the best way to do it is uh, if you have a question, just uh, raise your hand, and then uh, and then either uh, I will call on you, and you will, uh, and either I will unmute you, or you can unmute yourself. Uh, but this uh, this avoids a kind of a collusion uh, collision where a lot of people start talking at the same time. So are there any uh, questions and comments? Okay. I see no raised hands. So uh, how too about, quick. <laughs> that may be too quick, but um, what, what we can do is, uh, Aslam, if you can, uh, I would be very interested to hear a little bit more of your discussion slides, and especially if you go back uh, one uh, one slide before, uh, your last bullet point that you said uh, that um, uh, f uh, that you are you are going to discuss why exclusive dealing, dealing uh, uh, as can uh, can win with exclusive dealing. Uh, when, okay. the, when the fringe number is fixed. Can you elaborate on that? It, okay. I think it goes back to one of the first questions we had. Yes, yes, so, happy to do that. So let yeah. me then just go to this slide. Uh, as I said, maybe the platforms cannot condition their number of fringe products on the market structure with the marquee seller. This could be because of antitrust scrutiny, or it could be it, uh, some content available already under long-term contracts, or some reputation concerns, for instance, pay TV and all some content, so they can't just withdraw the content from the platform, okay? If this happens, basically, exclusive dealing of the B with the marquee is the unique equilibrium always uh, when there is no price discrimination. So that means there is no non-exclusive equilibrium. Why is this the case? Because the marquee will always increase the quality of the rival in that case, when the MBs and NS is exogenously given in the model such that the big platform has a higher number of fringe than the S platform, okay? So that's an interesting point to make because basically when we fix the fringe number, we get rid of non-exclusive equilibrium and there is only exclusive equilibrium which is harmful. However, starting from that, if we allow platforms to do price discrimination, set different prices to their locked-in base and uh, the consumer, new consumers, that will enable us to win exclusivity with the marquee seller and we did some parameters specifications how this could happen basically. This can happen if big platform does not care so much having the marquee exclusivity. For instance, 
if the number of fringe products is sufficiently large, okay, in this graph, the horizontal axis shows number of fringe products on the big platform compared to the small one, if it is sufficiently large or, or if, if the small platform base, the initial base is sufficiently large, we are in this blue area. Blue area is the area where the highest speed of the small platform is higher than the highest speed of the big platform for exclusivity. Okay. And again, this is a parameter specification. This is in line with the prediction of the Lee paper. Basically, in that area, small platform can be an exclusivity. And if you want to understand how the competition will affect that, again, if the platforms have sufficiently low degree of competition, differentiated market, but again, still covered market assumption holds, or the marquee product has sufficiently high value, we are in this blue region again, where the S platform can win the exclusive deal. Okay, so that's it just to say that if we can't have platforms choosing their fringe numbers at the same time they contract with the marquee, it might happen that S platform wins exclusivity with the marquee seller when platforms are allowed to price discriminate between loyals and uh, new consumers. Uh, can I intervene? Or? Yes, please. Yes, Bruno. I was a bit lost. It was very fast. Uh, so to get, I, I, I didn't get on this point. Uh, I think that what matters is whether the end is endogenous, so it's a quality dimension, as Jack said and uh, whether the market seller cares about it. Why do the market seller care about uh, MBONS? It does not care about MBNS. It just cares about it is compensation under yeah. different market structures. So, so could you write a more general model in which you have endogenous quality? Yeah. For getting platforms. And then you have a seller of some input, which is kind of important input, and if you by the input, then you have a different cost for quality, let's say lower cost. Yes. Okay. And uh, then you could have uh, just the same analysis in the sense, uh, almost without the platform. So the platform is one case where this yes. cost function is a particular shape, but there may be other cases where the cost function has a different shape. So then it becomes a problem of exclusivity of input. And I, I don't know the literature on that, but uh, you see what, uh, yeah. just to rebound on Jack's comment, actually, Jack made the same point. That, uh, okay. So, um, okay, so basically you are thinking of a model of competition and qualities where firms can prevent uh, each other to get access to particular technology that might enable them to, to reach that quality level at a more efficient uh, way. Yeah. That. That's, a, that's a good point. And uh, uh, definitely that's very similar to what uh, our model does. Uh, I need to think about a little bit more about, uh, um, so we, basically, um, Modeling of the fringe products makes sense if you want to capture this platform effects, right? We want to have this um, other product sellers number being endogenous in the model. But uh, in, your, in the model that you suggested, basically, uh, what matters would be just, you know, what is my technology to achieve this quality level? I don't care how I get there. It's just that some kind of a technology. Uh, I think if we shut down this black box of uh, sellers, uh, the model might indeed apply in this other broader context. Uh, yeah, I think we, we are, I mean, essentially, we're raising the cost of achieving a certain quality level. Right. By uh, having exclusive dealing. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's and, true. Uh, the second question is about the, the, the game. So you assume to take it or leave it off by the platform, but this is a market yeah. seller, so we could... Uh, you could revert the timing and the market seller could somehow yes. decide who is going to That get. was my discussion point. Indeed, if you give the market seller the entire bargaining power in our model, then there won't be exclusive dealing in equilibrium. Because then market seller would capture all the profits generated from its presence on both firms. So then there is no reason to go for exclusivity to get larger uh, rent. But then doesn't... There is not an issue with competition on the consumer side? 
that would dissipate the rent? Um, competition or consumption? For example, uh, competition may be quite intense. Uh, so basically, it's always efficient to, to have, Bruno, it's always efficient to have non exclusive dealing. And then yeah. the okay. marquee seller can has all the bargaining power, he can internalize any externalities. If he can have a full contract, uh, let's come back to the point you said before, if the market yes. seller has a complete contract setting and can control the price of the product and the fee charge to consumers. You but have. he can do that through his, his contract, right? He could, no, we need a very complex contract that would uh, depend on the number of consumers on each platform that would control for the price of the other product. Uh, that, uh, yeah, you're right. And a complete contracting setting would be right. Okay. Yeah. So we're allowing for a rich contract space to try to focus on a particular mechanism. But I'll let Oslo go. Yeah. No, but I think Bruno's question was hinting on uh, if the marquee is available on both platforms, it's kind of like competing away. It is a higher quality. And uh, and uh, if it was available only on one, it creates kind of this differentiation effect that previous literature was also mentioning, right? Mm -hmm. So content might prefer to go to one platform to capture larger rent if the competition is very stiff. And uh, it could be interesting to take a look at if the contracting is not perfect, yes. Uh, we haven't done this analysis. So we haven't given the bargaining power to Marquis, but we just had the conjecture that you know, in that case, there won't be a rent shifting incentive. So that's why we were expecting uh, no exclusive dealing. And the same for the vertical integration between one of the platforms and the marquee seller. But it could be interesting to see if the contracting is not perfect. How does this would change? So, so uh, let, us, uh, let us go to some other questions. Julian Wright has a question. Julian, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I had a very simple question. Um, just wanted to understand what happens if you go back to the baseline model and take the case where there's no asymmetry in the installed basis. Yeah. To remove any asymmetry, just wanted to, yeah. what's the equilibrium then? So, so basically it's then- sort of compare it to existing literature. Yeah. Um, so then basically if uh, their initial, so if I remove the asymmetry, okay, coming back to this first lemma, then the, without the marquee, the platforms will set the same number of fringe products or the same quality to start with, okay? And starting from there, of course, having the marquee would matter if this quality level was below uh, the marquee quality level. Okay, so the same arguments would apply. So if you are in this world that the initially platform were choosing a quality below the marquee quality uh, value level, then excluding my rivals still would give me competitive advantage. So there exists always an exclusive dealing equilibrium, but which platform wins is not determined because they are symmetric. Okay, but they so always the, want to is, bid. Yeah. So this is so to be multiple equilibrium. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome.